Welcome to the Foster Friendly Podcast, where we come together to make a difference in the lives of children in foster care and the families who care for them. Foster Friendly Communities are part of a nationwide movement by America's Kids Belong that helps people from all walks of life take action and help kids and families thrive. You'll hear from former foster youth, foster and adoptive parents, social workers, faith and business leaders, and other experts on how to engage in meaningful ways. Our hosts, Brian, Travis, and Courtney, explore inspiring stories of everyday people making a difference in foster care where they live and work. All right, everybody. It's good to have you here today. We are joined by one of our own with at AKB, Nanette Kirsch. Uh, Nanette is the Executive Director of Marketing and Communications for us. Uh, prior to coming to AKB, uh, Nanette was primarily working in tech marketing and with startups, and then she joined us in uh, 2021 and has been really instrumental in helping us uh, grow our reach and uh, helping with Foster Friendly Communities Initiative. Uh, Nanette lives in Raleigh, North Carolina, and is a mom to four young adult children, two of whom that she and her husband adopted from Korea. Uh, Nanette, I know you love to talk about yourself, so why don't you take a moment and share a little bit more from the heart of what I just uh, did in a brief introduction. Yes, sure, I do love to talk about myself. So it's kind of funny because the background that you have today, Brian, is kind of my first encounter with AKB. I got um, really energized about the organization when I listened to a podcast actually a couple of years ago where they talked about if every orphan deserves mm -hmm. a home, deserves a family. And um, loved the work that AKB was doing. And it kind of led to a year-long conversation between you and I, um, talking about what you were doing, trying to figure out where I might be able to plug in. And I did not anticipate then that I'd be here today, that I um, would have traded in my tech marketing career to um, work on recruiting families. And I have never looked back. I love it. Yeah, uh, when Nanette re reached out, um... I uh, was one super impressed, but we were also in a place where we weren't really ready to hire someone. So um, uh, I, uh, she always thinks I uh, <laughs> played hard to get, <laughs> and that wasn't, it, and that wasn't the reason. I really wanted her to join our team. <laughs> I was like, we're broke. <laughs> I was so, like, you just I, I'm not as cool as she thinks I was. <laughs> <laughs> just throw that money. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, yeah, she, she was uh, uh, driven by um, her own her own mission in life, and was uh, I, I, we don't need to get into the details, but was willing to um, uh, reduce what she would normally make. Uh, in order to join this team and help help kids who need families, so grateful for her heart. Yeah, really happy to have you on today. So that's a great segue into kind of what we're going to talk about next, and have you kind of share with us, Nanette. Of so your background, as Brian said, was primarily in tech marketing. How has that experience helped you in leading the marketing strategy now at the nonprofit America's Kids Belong? Some differences, some of your perceptions around that. Um. Yeah, I was thinking about that a lot. It is kind of interesting. I think one of the things was that there it really was a building opportunity similar to a startup. Um, only I had the privilege to walk into a really powerful platform. Like there was a strong national um, social media platform, a lot of recognition and respect for the AKB brand. Um, and so that was nice, but we hadn't really built a marketing capability. And so looking at... Um, in my SaaS marketing background, a lot of the work you do is to get people into your funnel and help move them through to a decision about a software subscription. In this case, we're asking people to invest their lives, to do something a lot mm -hmm. harder to foster or to adopt a child into their mm -hmm. family ever. And mm -hmm. so um, really taking, I think, a learning posture and trying to understand what are the steps in that journey? What are the obstacles that people run into? And so applying a lot of the same questions that I learned to ask in for-profit sector marketing to something a lot more personal for people um, and just cultivating the empathy. I had to really learn how to write differently because I tended to write B2B feature benefits kind of messaging, and this is a lot more complex. Mm. Um, so I think that stepping stone, kind of working with you, Travis, and Brian, and 
the rest of the AKB team um, who were really fortunate. So many are actually living that mission to kind of understand their journeys and use that experience to build into the experience that we're, I think, making great progress to create for people through our own um, marketing outreach has been really interesting. Hmm. So then that you said something that um, I think is just key want to highlight is that in your prior work over the decades, a lot of what you were marketing was a, a product or service uh, to a business that said, this thing will make your work better, easier, it'll make you more profitable. And then you had to switch to, we're asking you to do something that'll make your life harder. <laughs> no kidding. That's such a good point, Brian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're asking you, yeah, to do something extremely challenging. Um, which really is um, part of the reason we created Foster Friendly. And, um, you know, this, this podcast is called Foster Friendly, and uh, we ca cover a lot of topics, but today we're specifically talking about Foster Friendly community. So, and it was a bit of an evolution. Um, why don't you um, share with our audience a bit of why we felt like uh, this Foster Friendly community was a, a, a critical um, idea. I told you it was going to be challenging doing a podcast with you because when I explain things in the market, I always quote you. So Brian Mavis <laughs> always says, not everybody is called to foster or adopt, but we're all called to do something. And it is a small population. There's only about 200,000 licensed foster homes and it's a hard walk. And so part of it was how do we invite more people into the mission? What are ways that people can get involved, even if foster care and adoption aren't something that they can take on? And so when I joined, you all already had the Foster Friendly app, which had business discounts and some churches on it um, who offered things like wraparound teams or support group ministries. Um, but it wasn't as vibrant because one of the things that also is true from my previous background is a piece of technology alone isn't ever going to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. It is what you put huh. behind it. It's the cultural change that has to happen with it that's necessary for it to really deliver the value. You need a champion, you need someone who's going to embrace it. And mm. so from my perspective of how do we get more people into this game and um, what are some ways that we can help this app take life, it needs to live it at a community level that when you look nationally and say there's 400,000 kids in the US foster care system, that feels like an overwhelming problem. And yeah. me as one person, I don't think I can impact that. But if you tell me in my community, there's 100 kids in foster care, hmm. I can much more easily feel empowered to impact that. And I think the app was sort of the genesis of starting some other on ramps um, to bring every stakeholder group in a community together that everybody can do something. And Brian, I know a lot of your work previously had been at a state level with kind of a similar um, Malou, that one of AKB's strengths coming in was that they knew how to bring a lot of disparate groups together to have collective impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, with that, the we were looking at kind of three, dividing the United States into three sectors, so three slices of this pie. And uh, we felt like we had uh, good inroads into the government side, whether it was uh, child welfare specifically or it was elected officials. Um, we also felt like we had a good inroads into the faith community, how to uh, elevate the work that they're doing or activate them. And the place that we were um, trying to crack this nut and struggling a bit was in the market space, in the business community, which is the largest space in the United States and also the least active and the business community, um, you have a, a lot of business uh, leaders, owners, managers who care about social issues, uh, but there were uh, a couple of problems we were trying to overcome. One was uh, the business community does not think about foster care. It is not on their radar. They tend to think when they think of social issues, uh, they think of homelessness or addiction or mental health. Those are kind of the top three, I think. And they don't think of foster care, which is a pipeline to those hmm. three issues and a few others. Um, the the other issue was that uh, businesses typically thought, well, in order for my business to make a difference, um, there's only two options, write a check or um, close down my business for a day and go volunteer somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so what the nut we were trying to crack was, 
what if their business could be part of the solution? And so uh, this this is the idea that we were trying to solve. And I feel like uh, we've we've I think we've cracked the nut. So um, so once you riff off that a little bit, Nanette, just take whatever I just said and expand on it. Yeah, I think um, finding a way. I, I love the idea that businesses don't have to stop what they're doing to mm -hmm. have social impact. Um, and I think the other piece that's powerful is that I think it has the ability to change hearts and minds within that organization as an employer. So yeah. um, it comes hmm. to mind and you can add to this, Travis, because you spoke with him, but Nicholas Kelly comes to mind, who is a young guy that we know in Georgia, who's a foster dad in his 20s as a single dad. Um, and he owns a, a tavern, a local restaurant business. And so not only does he offer a discount to families, which is really helpful to a family with extra kids in the house to say, hey, we can get a discount on our meal. But every family that comes in, he's taught his employees about foster care. He said, let me know so he can come and welcome them. Mm -hmm. um, he offers to pray with them. And he cares a lot about creating an impact and really helping them feel connected. And so I think one of the things that we really believe at AKB is that it isn't about just the discount. Like, yes, that's helpful. Right. And it's great to be able to take your kids to the zoo and give them experiences they wouldn't have. <clears throat> But it's also that being a foster parent is, like you said, it's a lot of extra work. It can be super isolating. And if you feel like your community sees and values you the same way we do other first responders, policemen, mm -hmm. and military, and we say this is important to the well-being of our community, um, then you're really able to make a difference and I think help foster families stay in the game longer. Yeah, I love that. And that, that bears out across sort of a lot of people's experiences, just that idea that I, as a foster parent, to be seen has intrinsic value that, you know, supersedes, I mean, the, the practical discounts are important, but those are the things that really keep you going because you feel like you're not alone in that community. And yeah, it, I really love that. So, so then that, um, on the, back on the tech side of things, then, you know, foster friendly is, um, trying to. Uh, what maybe one way to put it is put um, make social work more social and and that is getting uh, using technology to get more people into the into the place. So talk a little bit more about the app, the technology, how that helps facilitate um, a more relational component to this work. I think that's been um, the most exciting thing to me as we've leaned into this foster friendly communities notion is we used to lead with the app, which is like a mistake yes. every tech marketer makes, right? And I fell for it again is like, hey, we've got this great app and it's got discounts. And that's really not what it is. It's we've got this great community and now we have a way to connect everybody in the community. So there were foster closets doing work and it was word of mouth. Like you had to tell Travis who told me and you're trying to suss out in your spare time while taking care of kids who have a lot of needs, what resources are available to you. Now all you have to do is download an app to your phone and everything in your community is there. So you have the visual reinforcement that all of these organizations, churches, nonprofits, businesses see and care about what I'm doing and they stand with me. And I have practical ways to actually connect with those and access those that don't take a lot of extra time and energy. And I think that's super powerful. So I want to um, just, I think right now I just realized, I think maybe the three of us, we have the curse of knowledge and we're assuming some stuff. So let's, let's go back to say uh, to the audience, Hey, um, look on your phone, go to your apps. Yeah. And there's an app called foster friendly. Um, Nanette, walk through, uh, like you just did uh, an example of other nonprofits that can go into the space. T tell our listeners, if you go to this app, um, here's, here's what you can expect to see and how it's helpful. That's a great point. Um, so in the communities where we're active, you will find um, entertainment options that foster families really appreciate. Part of what they want to do when they're caring for a child is give them experiences they might not have otherwise. So zoos, museums, mm -hmm. any kind of family entertainment is on there. Events, if there's a festival or something going on locally, those events are available so you can take advantage of those as a family. Um, restaurant discounts and anything food related obviously is always popular. Um, so there's a lot of um, BOGO offers and um, things designed for kids. 
And then there's some really creative, interesting things like um, hair salons, photography, ways to, to make a child feel special and maybe give them things they've never had, a birthday party, a professional photography sitting, and um, even being part of a family portrait, right? Actually having that belonging um, in a family. And then on the faith community side, um, you'll find local churches who are offering anything from kids nights out that are trauma aware. And Brian, I'll let you expand a little more on the trauma awareness side. Um, support groups for foster and adoptive families because it is hard and it's helpful to be able to talk to other people who can offer empathy um, and wraparound teams, which I think we've seen a lot of success with where a group of people in a church will wrap around a member of their congregation or a member of their community who, when they're actively fostering and work with that family to understand what their needs are. Maybe it is um, people to help drive kids to after school activities or someone to watch their other kids when they have a visitation somebody to mow the lawn or help bring groceries, things that are just hard to do when you're in a new placement. Um, those teams make a huge difference because that early um, placement time, that early period is really critical. And then as we talked about nonprofits and people who are already helping um, are connected through the app. So it's just a way to make them available. Um, one other thing that we're offering as well are resources and we're continually expanding um, what are the books, the films, the agencies and organizations that might be able to be resources for you to continue to expand your knowledge, to gain trauma information, to deal with parenting challenges and things of that nature. So there's a lot there. And we rely on the parents, too, to nominate businesses, nominate um, offers and things that they think would be a good addition to the app. So it is very user driven in how it's growing. Yeah. So, um, so then maybe like to take the other side. So we're that was speaking to the foster families who are utilizing this. Um, there's a, another audience, and that's kind of the providers. It's the it's the churches, it's the businesses, it's the city that has um, public services that do things. It's um, kind of the things where there's special events. So uh, let's let's um, focus on that side. So it's the it's the People who say, I do care about this issue, my heart and head has been turned towards these kids, but we can't foster, we can't adopt, we want to do something. So um, what? give, give some examples of um, what uh, churches can do. Well, I think um, churches are probably in some of the best position to have a direct impact on family sustainability because they can be hands and feet. They can actually show up for families in material ways. So I think the kids nights out are one of the things um, yeah, to huge. make a huge difference, right? <clears throat> so we have quite a few um, faith communities that offer those on a quarterly basis, either on their own or they partner with other faith communities in their area and um, do trauma awareness training with their volunteers and staff who are going to be working that, which is just really equipping people to respond in a healthy way to behaviors and hmm. actions of kids who have had a lot of trauma and understand why they're acting the way they are and just how to de-escalate um, the situation, which is a real comfort to parents. Otherwise, it's hard to get a night out, hard to get some respite. So I think that's a really valuable one. Um, I think just seeing, understanding who are the people in your congregation who hmm. are currently serving in that capacity and recognizing them and asking what they need and finding ways as a faith community to respond to that. Um, and then I think it's also great community outreach that churches yeah. are always looking for ways to impact the community, to better the places where they're living and, and serving and um, support groups. And obviously the kids nights outs don't have to be limited to that. Um, and the wraparound teams that we talked about a little bit are all ways to say, we're going to show up for you and support what you're doing and help lighten your load in some mm. material way. Yeah, we talk about um, having uh, foster friendly churches. And so um, our qualifications for that, we used to go into churches and say, here's two dozen <clears throat> different ideas that you can do. And the smorgasbord, and uh, it either was, it, it seemed to be either overwhelming and they did nothing, or they picked a thing that mm -hmm. wasn't really that helpful in moving the mm -hmm. needle. And so we um, narrowed it down to three best practices. One being that the children and youth workers are trauma trained. Uh, you know, they're not experts, but they at least have the lenses to see and recognize trauma behavior. Secondly, is that the uh, church has an ongoing ministry like the couple you just described, Annette. 
and we have resources, but we also point to other uh, organizations that are helping churches with stuff that they do. And the third thing uh, was that the church teach on it once a year minimally in uh, what we call a um, meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And we kind of leave that a little bit ambiguous to let the church decide how they want to do that. Uh, the other thing that if you're, you're if you are listening and you are uh, uh, you have influence in your church, uh, the church is another great place besides doing that to let business leaders, mm -hmm. business managers yeah. know about this uh, opportunity in their community. And so, uh, you know, for example, uh, we connected with the church and they just did a brief uh, plug for this and yes. got over 100 businesses. Uh, to uh, sign up to be foster friendly in their community. So uh, the church has um, a tr tremendous platform mm -hmm. to help help a community be, be foster friendly. Well, that goes back to what you were saying before, too, that there just isn't a high level mm -hmm. of awareness of foster care in general. And from a business perspective, mm -hmm. even a thought about how they might be able to impact that in a positive way. So it's a great place to start is to activate businesses that already have some commitment to faith, commitment to serving, and help them connect the dots that in what you do, you can actually make a difference in a pretty simple hmm. way. And I, you know, interviewing some churches from America's Kids Belong who've worked with us, have gotten some of the trauma training in our foster-friendly faith communities, I've gotten some feedback to things even like that they'll say, they've had foster families say, this is the first service I was actually even able to sit through because there's a culture and people are mm -hmm. equipped to understand that, hey, when Jimmy's kind of freaking out, it's okay. He's going to the back. We've got people to be there with him. I mean, if we can't, and I think the mentality is like, if we can't take care of our own in that congregation, mm -hmm. I mean, now we're looking to go to Africa to help people. I mean, come on here. Something isn't really making sense. And you're also seeing too, some of these churches by doing that internally in their walls, they're attracting people coming to the church because they're hearing how much they're caring for their people. I think so one, that, uh, no. oh, I'm sorry. No, go, ahead. Um, go ahead. Did you have, you want to re re respond to that? Okay. Um, the, um, I guess the question I, I, I have in my mind is really what, what, how does a community look different? Um, either before and after or uh, one community versus another one that's foster friendly and one that's not, um, what would, what would it feel like? What would the lived experience be like for foster families, maybe kinship families and, uh, for the children, especially, mm -hmm. um, like what, what's the difference going to be? Isn't that what I think as we evolved this idea in the organization, I think that's what got us all so excited about this notion is mm -hmm. our mission is to, dramatically improve the experiences and outcomes for kids in foster care. And that's deep work. That isn't something that happens because you give kids backpacks. It takes a lot of time and a lot of commitment. Um, one of the analogies I was thinking of, and, and that's where I was starting to go with what Travis said, is you think about a child that's had trauma, and I can make a parallel to coming home with a newborn. You've not experienced that before, and you feel completely underwater. And mm -hmm. what traditionally has helped a family get through that is extended family and having grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins all come around that family and pour into that child. As a community, mm -hmm. kids in foster care need to belong too, and they belong right. to our communities. They belong to the families that take care of them, and they belong to their bio families, and they need to feel a part of that. And so when we all say, we're gonna pour into these kids, and we believe as a community that when our children flourish, our community flourishes. And if anyone right. in our community is hindered in being able to do that, we all lose. And I think when we embrace that sense of connectedness to those children as part of our future and the flourishing of our own community, that that's really powerful. And if you can do something simple, if all of us can do a simple thing, maybe we can't foster per se, maybe we can, because a lot of times I think people think it's harder than it is, that there are, you can have pets, you can have other kids. There's a lot yeah. of right perceptions people have of what obstacles might be there. But if you can offer a discount in your business, if you can encourage your faith community to step up and do a thing to support families, if you can get other nonprofits, whether they directly support foster care or not, to think about how they might be able to support foster care or support families that are providing foster care, it becomes wholly different. I think you can feel the difference. Um, 
one of our mayors in Ackworth, Georgia talked about, it's another way to care for vulnerable people that Mm -hmm. communities want to do that. Elected officials want to understand who's not thriving, who's not able to be the best in the community and help bring them along. And as you've talked about and written about extensively, Brian, if you can affect kids while they're still in foster care and help them thrive, you're going to avoid a whole lot of things down the road, downstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to add too, like, I love what you said, how it brings people together for the cause, a just cause that needs our eyes and attention. But also, even if you zoom out even further, think about like, in the U.S. right now, we're so polarized, disconnected. What actually even any more brings us together? I think, Brian, you've talked about tornadoes, natural disasters. Outside of natural dis- disasters, and this is an invisible, as you've mentioned, sort of social dis- crisis, mm-hmm. it is this way foster care gives us a way to actually need one another. Foster parents then need faith communities who need businesses. Businesses can now you know, kind of have new relationships connecting to them. So it's this also way that it just the whole society Mm -hmm. becomes weaved together and needing one another. So Nanette, um, as, as we're uh, heading to uh, a close on this, I'm thinking about the listener right now and they're looking at their app and there's nothing around their town is not foster friendly. There's no, there's no little pen marks around them. You know, the closest thing is 500 miles away um, for those people who are saying, I, I want to bring foster friendly to my community. Um, it, I'm, I'm more than just interested in this. I like, I'm, I'm passionate and I'm the kind of person who gets things done. Uh, what, what do they do? What's their, what's their next step? One option is to reach out to Brian and talk to him for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, that's an option. <laughs> but actually, um, if you go to our website, mm-hmm. americaskidsbelong.org, um, we have a web contact form throughout the site where you can check, I want to start a foster-friendly community where I live. Um, we, we are working actively to develop a very consistent process that would guide folks who are interested in how to coalesce the resources they need in their community and actually work in a cohort with other communities Um, We're hoping to launch those every May, which is Foster Care Awareness Month, and every December, which is National Adoption Awareness Month. November. Did I say, oh, I said December. Thank you, November. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you can get in one of those cohorts, and and there is no um, super strict timeline, but there are milestones of here's the things that you need to move to the next step. So um, simply filling out that form will get you in our system. Um, We also are doing a series of webinars that start this July in October. Um, There's one specific to supporting foster families that will take a close look at foster friendly communities, have some of our current community leaders talk about the strategies that they've used um, to bring this to their community. But I think the important thing is that bringing the app alone wouldn't be enough. You could just bring the app, get a few businesses signed up and you won't have changed anything, but you also can be, a voice in your community to bring together um, the players in your community. And it isn't that hard to do. Like you said, you get a church who's willing to make an appeal to the business members. Um, Mm -hmm. You find a chamber of commerce or a rotary club or others who are willing to activate around this as their issue. And you can very quickly um, get to a point where you've got a good foundation to um, start to make lasting change, sustainable change in your community. Great. Well, Nanette, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I want the audience to know that Nanette has been a gift to AKB, a gift to me. Great heart, great brain. Um, Also just really um, kind and mature. And so Hmm. thank you for being on the team and thank you for helping just a lot of people who are um, on this journey. And this is kind of their first, they're taking their first steps, their on-ramp and helping um, guide people in a way so that they're, um, you know, they're, they're making progress and they're not taking missteps along the way. So, so grateful for uh, your guidance to so many people. I'm grateful to be here. I I think as a closing thought, one thing that I just wanted to offer is the core appeal. um, AKB was built on the power of story that our original program of I belong project was really capturing the stories of kids in foster care and letting them share their stories um, to connect them with families and 
Travis and I, and working with you, Brian, we've all had the privilege of really leaning into some of these stories in foster care. And when you have the opportunity to touch the heart of a child in need, or you are able to facilitate that, it's endlessly, endlessly rewarding. And I, hmm. one of the things I love most about working at AKB is no one on our team ever gets tired of a great story. Like every right. win for a kid, they celebrate and it is <laughs> such motivation to continue. And I, I think that would be my message to listeners is, is it hard? Yes. And is there a lot of hurt? Yes, but it's so worth it because they're kids and they're still growing and they have an opportunity and you have an opportunity to play a part in, along the way. So how could you not do something? Man, that is so true. And then, <laughs> I, I was at an event uh, a couple of days ago and, and heard some new stories that I hadn't heard before about kids and from, from the I Belong Pro, uh, Project shoots. And um, <laughs> it, it made, they made, <laughs> those stories made me cry. I was like, gosh, here I am. Uh, I know I, I still have, uh, in, in spite of being in this space and being uh, well aware of uh, the hardships and lots of stories, um, they, they still, gosh, these kids stories are so hmm. tough and so tender, hmm. uh, that, um, they can, uh, take an adult heart and soften it. <laughs> How true is that? There was a great line by someone that said, he who tells the best story shapes the culture. And, and I love what you kind of are ending with here, because when I think of foster care, it's it's for many people it's this invisible largely invisible space few know about or the narrative that exists is so negative the brokenness of the system child welfare's difficulties you're stepping in and leading us in net and marketing in a way that's trying to shift the narrative and actually make these stories front and center and be actually places of inspiration mm -hmm. not places of dysfunction. oh another mm -hmm. story about foster care that's so disheartening so I, and I've just seen that too. I want to echo what Brian said. Just like you're bringing such talent and heart to that. Nice. Thank you. Well, it was Thanks, fun Anna. to chat with y'all. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, now uh, we know you're uh, watching your grandson. And uh, so we want to make sure that uh, he's being attended to. So that's right. We'll, we'll sign off. Out. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. We'll <laughs> see ya. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, will you help us reach more people by subscribing, sharing the podcast with a friend, and leaving a five-star review? If you've been inspired by what you've heard today and want to learn more of how you can make a difference for kids in foster care and the foster families where you live, visit americaskidsbelong.org. We depend on individual donors to fund our work. We'd be grateful if you would consider joining us as a monthly donor. Visit americaskidsbelong.org to make your tax-deductible donation. Thank you. Together, we can ensure a family for every child in foster care and a foster-friendly community to ensure every foster family feels loved and supported.